Okay, so this is chapter 10, and we're going to be talking about muscle tissue. We're going to jump right in, and we're going to talk about the three events that occur in order for a muscle to contract. So I'm just going to kind of put it out here, the three different um, uh, processes that we're going to talk about. The first process are the events that occur at the neuromuscular junction. Right? So if you remember what the neuromuscular junction is, that is when the nerve comes in contact with the muscle. Right? So we're going we're gonna to look at what happens there and how um, that muscle then becomes stimulated. The next process we're going to talk about is excitation, contraction, coupling. So excitation, contraction, coupling. And so this is a long word, right? But if we break it down, it's, it's going to couple the excitation of that action potential to when the muscle actually contracts and those sliding filaments slide over each other. So the excitation portion of it is the action potential, and that's when the action potential gets onto the muscle, and then the action potential causes calcium to be released, and then calcium causes the sliding of the filaments to occur. So we're going to look at that too. And then the last uh, process that we're going to talk about is the contraction cycle itself. And in the contraction cycle, this is when we have the thin filaments sliding over the top of the thick filaments toward the M line. So we're going to start by looking at this drawing and let's kind of get ourselves oriented here. So this is our neuron over on this side and this is the axon terminal or the synaptic terminal. Right? Then we have a space here and that space is called the synaptic cleft. And then we have the muscle on the other side, and the muscle is made of skeletal muscle fibers. So fibers are muscle cells. So we're going to look at the three different processes that occur here, and we'll go step by step. So first of all, we're going to look at an excitable neuron. So the neuron is sending these action potentials. They're propagating down the axon of the neuron until they get to the axon terminal. At the axon terminal, there are these voltage-gated calcium channels. And so those calcium channels are sensitive to the voltage. Well, the voltage of the action potential goes all the way up to plus 30, and it goes all the way back down to a negative 90, and then it finally goes back to resting in an action potential. And so this is going to stimulate those calcium channels. So the calcium channels go from being closed to then being open because of that voltage change. Now, calcium is higher out in the extracellular fluid. So calcium will move into the synaptic terminal. When calcium moves into the synaptic terminal, it's going to stimulate these vesicles right here to release their contents out into the synaptic cleft. Now, these vesicles contain chemicals, thousands of these chemicals, and these chemicals are called ACH or acetylcholine. So when calcium arrives, it will cause these vesicles to fuse to the wall of the axon terminal uh, through a process that we call exocytosis and release the ACH molecules out into the synaptic cleft. So now we have all of these ACH molecules out into this synaptic cleft. Now, some of these ACH molecules will just float away and, and move away from the synaptic cleft, but a lot of them are going to move across the synaptic cleft, and they're going to bind to receptors on that skeletal muscle. So let's look at the skeletal muscle. So where that axon terminal comes into contact with that skeletal muscle, we call that the motor end plate, right? So not all areas of the skeletal muscle are going to be a motor end plate, so only where that axon terminal comes in contact with it. So on the cell membrane of the muscle, we have these, these channels, and these channels are gated channels, 
And so, but they're, they're sensitive to chemicals. So we call them a chemical gated channel. And because they'll only let sodium through, we call them a chemical gadium sodium channel. And on the surface of that gated channel is a receptor. And so that receptor is specific to the ACH molecule. So when ACH is in the synaptic cleft, it'll travel across the synaptic cleft and bind to that receptor. What happens then is that the channel will open up. So here we see over here, we have the channel, but now it's opened up. So there's one side of the channel, there's the other side of the channel, and now it's open. Because it's a sodium channel, that means sodium will move through it now that it's open. Well, we know that sodium is higher outside the cell than it is inside the cell. So it's, it's higher in the extracellular fluid. Since that channel is open, sodium will be able to rush into that muscle cell and bring its positive charges in there, and that's going to depolarize the muscle cell. So the muscle cell can depolarize just like a neuron can. If enough positive charges come into that skeletal muscle fiber, it might reach threshold. And if it reaches threshold, then an action potential on the muscle will be generated. So now we have these little action potentials. The action potentials travel over the surface of that membrane just inside the surface until they get to this tubule called a T-tubule. The action potentials then travel down the T-tubule until they get to this uh, structure called the terminal cisternae. All right, so let's back up and let's talk about uh, what we just learned. We learned what happened at the neuromuscular junction. This is the junction between the neuron and the muscle, right? So that's the neuromuscular junction. Those are all the steps that are going to occur. Now, uh, we'll talk in a couple of minutes about how uh, that actually stops, how a muscle stops contracting. And one of the places where um, the stopping action occurs is going to be at this neuromuscular junction. So we'll just, we'll come back to that. All right, so that's what happens at the neuromuscular junction. Now we wanna discuss what happens at the, during the excitation contraction process, uh, the excitation contraction coupling process. So in this process, those action potentials get down to this area that's called the terminal cisternae. So the terminal cisternae is a bunch of channels that wrap around each individual myofibril inside the muscle cell. So let's go back and revisit that. So inside a muscle cell are all these organelles, right? It's a, it's a cell, so it has all these organelles. This, the um, terminal cisternae is one area, uh, it's part of an organelle that's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's actually uh, the area near where the T-tubule is, but it's a part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the terminal cisternae stores calcium. So we have all these little calcium molecules in the terminal cisternae, and they're just stored in there. And they're just waiting for an action potential to release them, okay? Now, this sarcoplasmic reticulum is wrapped around these myofibrils. So each myofibril will have its own sarcoplasmic reticulum wrapped around it, right? Now, what's a myofibril? A myofibril is another organelle inside the uh, skeletal muscle fiber, inside the cell. The myofibril is a protein, and inside that myofibril, we have those contractile proteins called myosin and actin. And we'll be talking more about those. Um, so let's go back. Let's look at what happens when that action potential travels down the T-tubule. It travels down until it gets to the terminal cisternae. When it hits the terminal cisternae, it stimulates the terminal cisternae to release all of those calcium molecules into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So now they're, they're covering the whole um, myofibril, 
right? So they're, all the calcium is coming out. It's, it's, not, it's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is permeable to this um, calcium, which means that calcium will diffuse from higher to lower concentrations. Well, since it's higher concentration inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's going to diffuse out into and over the top of the myofibril. So what we just explained here was that process called excitation, contraction, coupling. The excitation portion of it was the action potentials that were traveling down. Then the contraction portion of it was that the calcium will be released from that um, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then the calcium molecules are going to bind to the troponin on the actin molecules. And that is excitation contraction coupling. It's the action potential, the release of calcium, and the binding of calcium to troponin. The next process that we're going to talk about then is the contraction cycle. So the contraction cycle occurs inside the myofibrils. When the calcium ions bind to troponin, that's when this is going to start, when this contraction cycle is going to start. Let's take a look at what we see inside the myofibril. So inside the myofibril are these proteins that are contractile proteins that are called actin and myosin. And they are arranged in a unit that we call the sarcomere. So here from this zigzagged line here, and this we call the Z-line, over to this Z-line over here, we see a couple of things. First of all, we see the thick filaments, which are called myosin. So this line here is the M-line. And then there we have myosin, here we have myosin, and here, these are just protein, myosin proteins. They're part of the sarcomere. Then we have the thin filaments, and the thin filaments are going to overlap a little bit with those thick filaments. And so all these red lines here, these are the actin molecules. Now the myosin molecules, those blue lines, we call the thick filaments. And the red lines there, the actin molecules, we call the thin filaments. What happens is that the blue myosin molecules are going to grab on to, that, um, to those thin filaments. And they are going to pull them towards the center of the sarcomere. And on this side, they're going to pull this. They're going to be this way. And then they're going to pull this way. So the thin filaments start to come towards that M line, that middle of that sarcomere, and it shortens the whole sarcomere. So this from here to here is a sarcomere. It becomes shorter. That is what we call the contraction cycle. And when all of these sarcomeres in the myofibril are going to contract and shorten, then the whole myofibril will shorten. And then if that happens in all of the myofibrils, then all the myofibrils will shorten and the entire skeletal muscle fiber will shorten. Now, when calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, all of the myofibrils in the muscle fiber are going to contract. And if enough muscle fibers in that skeletal muscle shorten, then the muscle develops what we call tension. So let's take a closer look at the contraction cycle because you do need to know the steps of the contraction cycle as well. What's gonna happen in the contraction cycle, if we look above here, we can see the sarcomere. So this right here, this middle, that is the M line. And then we see the myosin molecules that are attached to that M line. So there are um, myosin molecules starting at the M line and going out this way. And there are myosin molecules starting at the M line and going out this way. All right, so they extend off of both sides of that M line. Then we have the uh, thin filaments, and the thin filaments overlap those thick filaments. So the actin molecules overlap the myosin molecules. 
right? So these red lines here, those are actin molecules, and we also call those thin filaments. And the blue lines, those are thicker. They're made of myosin, which is a protein, and we call those thick filaments. Right? And we can see where they overlap. We can see where the thin filaments and the thick filaments overlap. And so where they overlap, we call that the zone of overlap. Right? Uh, the thin filaments end at the Z line out here. So that's the Z line. Okay, now what's going to happen, like I said in the previous slide, is that the myosin molecule, they, they have these heads on them. And those heads are going to bind to the thin filaments. Um, and when they bind to the thin filaments, they are going to pull that thin filament towards the center of the um, sarcomere. And when they pull towards the center of the sarcomere, that zone of overlap then is going to get much bigger. So the thin filament um, become, gets you know, much closer. And so our zone of overlap is now going to be this big uh, as the thin filament is pulled closer on each side. Okay, so our, our zone of overlap just gets really much bigger. And the whole sarcomere then shortens. All right, well, let's look and see how that actually happens. So down here, we can see thin and thick filaments. So first, we'll go over the thin filaments. So these red balls here, these are actin proteins, and they're strung together like a chain of pearls. Usually there's two of these chains of actin molecules, but here I'm just going to demonstrate one. Otherwise, they would just be kind of twisted around each other, you know, like that. But we're going to, um, we're not going to, we're not going to show it that way. We're just going to show it with one string. So what is on that actin molecule, though, is a active, an active um, site. So here we can see the active site on the actin molecule. And then over the top of that active site, we have a protein that hides it. So that protein hides it. And that protein is called tropomyosin. Tropomyosin. Okay, so tropomyosin is covering up that active site. And um, attached to the tropomyosin are these other little molecules that are called troponin. Okay, now when the calcium gets released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the calcium is going to bind to that troponin. And when it binds to the troponin, it rolls the tropomyosin away, and now the active sites are going to be exposed. So let's look over at this other one over here, and I'll just show you where um, show you one that's where it's exposed. Okay, so here's the actin, here's the active site on the actin, here's the tropomyosin way over here, and then here's the troponin here. So it's been moved away, and now we have the active site is exposed, right? And calcium is bound to those troponins holding that tropomyosin away. So as long as calcium is present, the active site will be exposed. If calcium wasn't, pre uh, wasn't present, if calcium left, then tropomyosin would roll back over that active site and then um, we wouldn't be able to get shortening of that sarcomere. We wouldn't be able to get a contraction. All right, so now let's talk about the myosin molecule. So here we have the myosin molecule right here and the myosin molecule has two heads on it and it also has this little spring in its neck. And that spring can either be cocked uh, or it can be, um, which is called activated, or we can spring that, that, um, that joint there uh, and uncock it. So it can, it can spring, and when that springs forward, we call that a pivot. Uh, 
Okay, so the uh, myosin head is already in the activated or cocked position. And how it became cocked is that an ATP molecule bound to it when it was in its uncocked position. Then ATP splits. And when it splits, it also, that energy that's released from the ATP will cock that myosin head into that uh, activated position. So it just takes a little bit of energy from the ATP splitting and it cocks the head. When the ATP splits, it splits into two molecules. So we end up with ADP and phosphate. And both of them stay attached to the activated myosin head. The next thing that happens is that the activated head will automatically attach itself to that active site on the actin. So now these heads are bound to the active site on the actin molecule, okay? And they still have ADP and phosphate attached to them. At this point, phosphate will be released from the myosin head. And that makes that bond between the myosin head and the active site that much tighter. And then ADP gets released from the myosin head. And the releasing of the ADP is a little bit stronger, carries a little bit more energy, and that cocked myosin head will then pivot. And when it pivots, it moves into that inactivated position and it pulls that actin molecule along with it. So it kind of springs, right? It's like it's on a spring and then doom, it springs forward. And as it does that, it's pulling that actin molecule closer to the M line, closer to the middle of that sarcomere. But it hasn't been released from the active sites on the actin. What will release the myosin head from those active sites is that another ATP molecule will bind to that myosin head. And when that happens, we uh, see a release of the myosin head from the active site. And now we're gonna start over. The ATP molecule then on the myosin head is going to split. And when that happens, that myosin head will become activated. As soon as it's activated, it will then bind to an active site on that actin molecule, right? And then as soon as it binds, then the phosphate is released and that makes the bond tighter. And then the ADP is released and that makes that um, activated myosin head pivot and pull that actin molecule closer to the M line. And this is gonna continue. This process is going to continue. So let's look at the, the let's look at all the steps that happen. So first of all, calcium binds. Calcium binds to troponin. And the active site is exposed. Okay. The second thing that happens is the activated myosin binds. to the active site. Okay, the next thing that happens is that phosphate leaves, bond gets tighter. ADP leaves, myosin pivots. So the thin filament slides over the thick filament and then the myosin head has to be released. So in order for the myosin head to be released, another ATP binds and that cross bridge is released. Then ATP splits, 
into ADP and phosphate, and the myosin head recacks. As soon as the myosin head recocks, then the myosin head binds to actin, to the active site on actin. And then we just, we're gonna start over here. So the myosin head binds to actin, and then we're going to see that phosphate leaves, the bond gets tighter, ADP leaves, and the myosin head pivots. Then another ATP binds, the cross bridge is released. Then ATP splits into ADP and phosphate and the myosin head recocks. Then the myosin head uh, will bind automatically to the actin molecule. Then the phosphate leaves the myosin head and the bond gets tighter between actin and myosin. And then ADP leaves and the myosin pivots and it just keeps going, it just keeps going through this whole cycle. It will continue to go through this whole cycle as long as calcium is available. So we went over all of the steps that initiate a muscle contraction. First, ACH is released, and then it binds to the ACH receptors, and then that generates action potentials inside the muscle, and then the action potential moves down the T-tubule, causing the terminal cisternae to release calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, the calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to diffuse out and over those um, myofibrils, and then the calcium binds to those thin filaments, and then the contraction cycle begins. So those are all the steps that initiate a muscle contraction. But we also have steps then that break down a muscle contraction. So I want to go over those next. Okay. So first of all, ACH gets broken down in the synaptic cleft. There are these little um, enzymes that we call acetylcholinesterase, or A-C-H-E. The E stands for esterase. And acetylcholinesterase will break down acetylcholine and and the action potential that's being generated. Now, if there are more action potentials coming, of course, then um, we're going to have more acetylcholine being released. But if the action potentials stop, acetylcholine is going to stop the, uh, it's gonna stop that acetylcholine from binding to the receptors and opening up those sodium channels. So that's one thing that, ha that will happen. So our action potentials stop, and our acetylcholine will be um, broken down by acetylcholinesterase. So it gets broken down into acetyl and into choline. The acetyl group will then be brought back into the synaptic terminal, and it'll be reused uh, to make more acetylcholine. Okay. So that's one thing that happens. The second thing is that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to reabsorb those calcium ions. So calcium is going to get reabsorbed. However, it takes ATP to do that. So there is a calcium pump that will pump that calcium back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then the calcium will then move back into the terminal cisternae where it will be stored until another action potential comes down that T-tubule and causes it to be released. Right? At that point then, since there's no more calcium, then the, um, those thin filaments, we're going to see that that uh, tropomyosin is going to cover up those active sites uh, and um, there will be no more cross bridges being formed. So when all of these things occur, if there's, especially if there's no cross bridges being formed, the contraction ends, and then muscle relaxation begins. The muscle will return passively to its resting length. So there is a condition I want to talk to you about right now that occurs uh, with death, 
And that's when um, the skeletal muscles become deprived of nutrients and they become deprived of oxygen. And very soon, there's no more ATP. And if there's no more ATP, that means calcium can't be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that means that calcium is going to remain bound to the troponin uh, on top of the tropomyosin, keeping those active sites exposed. If the active sites are exposed, that means those activated myosin heads are going to remain attached to those, um, they're going to just remain attached, right, to those actin molecules. So now that sarcomere is in a sustained contraction, and we call that rigor mortis. So this is going to occur, uh, this physical state of rigor mortis will occur until the whole sarcomere starts to break down. The Z-lines break down, um, the filaments start to break down, and then two to seven hours after death, rigor mortis will end. During rigor mortis, because of those cross bridges and the sarcomeres being um, sustained in that shortened state, the muscles are going to appear very stiff. But after several hours then, all of those, uh, the, the Z lines break down, the myofibrils start to break down, and then the muscles start to relax again. But that can take up to, you know, two to seven hours after death. When the sarcomeres shorten during a contraction, they shorten the muscle fiber, that muscle cell, and we call that tension or muscle tension. The tension produced by an individual muscle fiber will vary, and so we're going to consider some specific factors that are involved with this variation. Really, the amount of tension produced by an individual muscle cell or muscle fiber during a contraction will depend on how many power strokes are performed by the cross bridges. The more cross bridges there are, the more tension that will be formed. I want to talk about the reasons why the tension varies. One reason it doesn't vary is because of the calcium ions. It's not like one muscle cell is going to get more calcium ions than another muscle cell because when the calcium ions are released, they're going to be released from all of the terminal cisternae in the muscle fiber. And so the muscle fiber itself is either all on or it's all off. It's either all producing tension or it's either completely relaxed. But there are reasons that do cause a variation in how much tension that individual muscle fiber does produce. So let's look at the individual um, variations. First of all, Tension production depends on the fiber's resting length at the time of stimulation. So basically, it depends on the zone of overlap. Right, so before the tension was produced, what was the zone of overlap? Or in other words, uh, what was the fiber's resting length at the time of stimulation? The second thing it depends on is the frequency of the action potentials or the frequency of the stimulation. That's going to affect how much um, calcium ions are going to be released. The faster those action potentials are traveling down that T-tubule, the more calcium that's going to be released which will cause more tension because there will be more cross bridges formed if more of the active sites on actin are exposed. So let's look at that first uh, variable, that zone of overlap, which describes the, how the fiber's resting length at the time of stimulation can affect the amount of tension in a muscle. Okay, so we want to look at the zone of overlap. So again, here is our sarcomere, right? This whole thing is the sarcomere. And we can see the zone of overlap. So what I mean by the zone of overlap is where do the red 
thin filaments overlap with the blue thick filaments, right? So we have this much overlap right here. So that's telling us how many cross bridges can occur because the myosin heads have to be able to attach to the actin molecules. They really can only do that right here in that zone of overlap. When the muscle fiber is stimulated to contract, only the myosin heads in that zone of overlap can bind to the active sites and produce tension. So for that reason, we can relate the tension produced in the entire muscle fiber to the length of the individual sarcomeres. And we call this the length tension relationship. So let's look at all of these here, right? So maximum tension is going to be produced when the zone of overlap is large, right? So we've got a large overlap here, but um, the thin filaments don't extend across the sarcomere center. If the sarcomere is too short when the muscle is at rest, then the thin filaments can extend across the center. So right here in this picture, I don't have them extending across the center, but I do have them coming very close to the center. So you can see those thin filaments, they're coming really close to the center. And what that does to our, zo our zone of overlap is that it makes it really big, right? So now this is at rest. So when we have this situation at rest, that means that all of these um, myosin heads are already pulling that thin filament as far as it can really go, so it doesn't really have much more where it can go. It decreases the amount of tension produced because it really doesn't have much more tension that it can produce. On the other hand, if the sarcomeres are stretched too far apart, which is what we see down here, now the thin filament has been stretched too far apart, Right? So if your muscle is stretched too far and it's stretching apart those thin filaments away from the thick filaments, now we have a really short zone of overlap. Right, So you can see there's not very much space between where the, the blue and the red or the thin and the thick or the actin and myosin molecules overlap. So now we don't have very many myosin heads that can even bind to that thin filament. So even at that point, if, the, um, if that zone of overlap is too small, then we're not going to get a great amount of tension either, right? Because we only have a few cross bridges here that can actually function. So either way, there will be less tension produced if at rest your zone of overlap is too large or your zone of overlap is too small. In other words, if the length of the muscle is large, you're going to have a small overlap and less tension can be produced. If your muscle length is too short at rest, you'll have too large of an overlap and you won't have as much tension produced. But if there is an optimal uh, zone of overlap, then maximum tension can be produced. So basically, in summary, the skeletal muscles are going to contract more forcefully when they are in their optimal resting lengths. Uh, for a couple of examples here, um, if you were to straighten your elbow, that's going to stretch your biceps brachii, pulling those um, sarcomeres into an optimal length. Now your bones in your elbow are going to stop your muscle from becoming overstretched. They won't allow, your elbow won't overextend, won't hyperextend, so you're not going to um, get a length that's too large. So the bicep muscle will be at its optimum length. Uh, another example is when you are walking. So when you're walking, your quadricep muscles are going to contract and then relax kind of in a cyclical type of pattern. So the muscle fibers are going to get stretched when, uh, when you are extending your hip. They're going to get stretched to a length that's very close to ideal.
before they're stimulated to contract, and then your quadriceps will contract and you'll lift your leg again. And then you'll relax and they'll go back to that stretched length and then they'll contract and they'll shorten again. All right, let's talk about frequency of stimulation now. The second thing that can cause variation of tension, right? So a single stimulus, a single action potential will produce a single contraction. That single contraction, so we've got a single action potential and it produces a single contraction. That single contraction is called a twitch. And the twitch lasts anywhere from seven to 100 milliseconds. So it's pretty short. It depends on which muscle is being stimulated. A single twitch is so brief that there's not gonna be enough time to activate a significant number of cross bridges. So there's really not enough contractions in order to um, produce enough tension for any type of useful work to have occurred in the muscle. However, if another action potential causes another twitch to occur before the tension returns to zero, the tension will peak at an even higher level because additional cross bridges form. So kind of think about pushing a child on a swing. You push gently to start the swing moving, um, but the second time you push the swing, that child's gonna go higher. And the third time you push the swing, the child's gonna go even higher than that. So that's what I mean by if you get an additional action potential, an additional twitch, it's just going to build that tension. So we'll take a look at these twitches, but you should know that um, most muscular contractions are going to involve sustained muscular contractions rather than individual twitches. So twitches, um, the duration of twitches are gonna depend on what type of muscle it is. We're gonna take a look at the gastrocnemius muscle, but um, different muscles are gonna have different durations. For example, the soleus muscle. Right, that's the muscle in the calf that um, it's a smaller muscle in your calf. Um, that twitch will last about 100 milliseconds. But one of your eye muscles, uh, a twitch in the eye muscle, that might only last 7.5 milliseconds. We'll take a look at the gastrocnemius because the gastrocnemius is somewhere in between those two. The gastrocnemia is the large calf muscle. Okay, so we'll look here. So this is a single twitch of the gastrocnemius muscle. And we can divide a single twitch into three phases. The latent phase, the contraction phase, and the relaxation phase. So there's three phases. The latent phase begins right at stimulation. It lasts about two milliseconds. And during this period, the action potential sweeps across the sarcolemma and the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium ions. So the muscle fiber is not producing any tension during this latent period because the contraction cycle hasn't even begun yet. So in the latent phase, calcium is released. And if we look at this graph here, we can see at zero right here, that's when the stimulus occurs, the stimulation. And we see this period of time right here where we have this latent phase where nothing has happened, it's just that calcium's been released. In the second phase, it's called the contraction phase, that's when tension starts to um, increase and it's gonna increase all the way to a peak. So as it's increasing, so we see it increasing here and going up, the tension's increasing. This is where calcium ions are binding to troponin. And the active sites are exposed and the cross bridges are formed and the contraction cycle begins. So this is the contraction cycle right here. And so in, during the contraction phase, that's when the contraction cycle is occurring.
This phase is going to last about 15 milliseconds. And then finally we get to the last phase, which is the relaxation phase, and that takes about 25 milliseconds. So during this period, uh, calcium is going to decrease because the calcium ions are being pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The active sites are covered up by tropomyosin, and then those active cross bridges start to um, decrease. So there's not as many, and since there's not as many cross bridges, then tension decreases to a resting level. So during the relaxation phase, calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So those are the phases that occur in a single twitch. Now let's look at what happens if another twitch comes along after that first twitch. If a skeletal muscle stimulated a second time, immediately after the relaxation phase of a twitch has ended, then that second contraction will have a slightly higher maximum tension than the first one did. The increase in maximum tension continues for about 30 to 50 stimulations, and then after that, the amount of tension remains constant. So this pattern is called trepe. Uh, it's a German name for staircase. So let's take a look at that on this um, graph up here. So we see that a twitch occurs and tension's developed, and then immediately after it relaxes, then another twitch is uh, produced, and then it relaxes, and then immediately another twitch, and then immediately another twitch, and then another one, and each of the following or subsequent twitches get to be bigger, uh, so there's more tension in each subsequent twitch. That will occur for maybe 30 to 50 stimulations, and after that, the amount of tension that's produced becomes constant, right? The rise that we get in each one of these twitches, the rise in tension that we get, is thought to be because the next twitch happens immediately after the relaxation phase, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum hasn't had enough time to recapture those calcium ions in between the stimulations. So there's just more calcium available in the cytosol. Most skeletal muscles aren't going to undergo trepe. They don't undergo this type of uh, pattern, but it is found in cardiac muscle. Another type of pattern that we see is called wave summation. So in this, if a second stimulus arrives before the relaxation period has ended, then a second more powerful contraction will occur. So remember with trepe, each subsequent twitch came immediately after the relaxation phase, but now with wave summation, we're not even waiting for the relaxation phase to be over with before another twitch occurs. So if the frequency of stimuli come fast enough, the relaxation phase won't have a chance to end before another twitch begins. We talk about stimulus frequency as how many stimuli per second. If the stimulus frequency is fast enough that the twitch is not able to complete its relaxation phase, then we'll get wave summation. But if the frequency were such that you were able to have relaxation, and the subsequent twitch occurred right after that, then we would have trepe. If the stimulation continues and the muscle fiber is never allowed to relax completely, then the tension will just keep building. It will increase until it reaches what we call maximum tension. Maximum tension is roughly four times the maximum produced by trepe. A muscle that produces this almost maximum tension is called incomplete tetanus. So here we see that the stimulations just keep coming, and the muscle tension keeps building and building and building, and eventually it reaches a plateau, and it never goes higher than that. That is called incomplete tetanus because it hasn't quite reached its maximum tension. It's underneath its maximum tension. But when a higher stimulation frequency eliminates the relaxation phase, then complete tetanus will occur.
In this case, the action potentials are coming so fast, the stimulation is coming so fast that the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum does not have enough time to reclaim those calcium ions. So the calcium ion level stays high in the cytosol and that's going to prolong the contraction, making it continuous. And that's where we get complete tetanus. In complete tetanus, there is essentially enough time for all potential cross bridges to form so that peak tension occurs and it's maintained. At this point, I do want to distinguish where that calcium is coming from. So you have to remember that the calcium that we're talking about is calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then it from the sarcoplasmic reticulum it diffuses out over the myofibrils which are um, still all of this is inside the cell so this is all occurring in the cytosol of the cell right in the healthcare field you're going to hear about calcium levels in the blood so this is different from the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We have the two different places of calcium and they have two different functions. So calcium inside the cell, inside that myofibril, if we look at that, here's a muscle cell, the calcium gets released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it causes the contraction cycle, right? It, it opens or it releases the tropomyosin from the active site on actin and we get that contraction cycle. So this calcium then has to be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then it has to be released again. And so it, it goes around in this cycle and it's always staying inside the cell. But there's also um, calcium that we saw at the uh, axon terminal, right? So this is the axon terminal that will cause um, acetylcholine to be released, which starts the action potential, which causes the release of calcium inside the cell. So the calcium here causes the exocytosis of acetylcholine, right? This calcium came from the blood. So this is the extracellular fluid, and another type of extracellular fluid is plasma. So you're going to hear about uh, a condition called hypercalcemia and another one called hypocalcemia, right? So you're going to hear these two things. So hypercalcemia means you have increased calcium in the blood and hypocalcemia means you have decreased calcium in the blood, right? So when you look at this then, you know, if you have increased calcium in the plasma, that means you're going to have increased calcium out here in the extracellular fluid because these fluids exchange very easily between the plasma and the extracellular fluid. So normally out here, you would think, okay, if you have a lot of extracellular um, calcium, that uh, there would be more acetylcholine being released because more calcium would come into the cell and more acetylcholine would be released. If more acetylcholine is being released, you would then uh, jump to the conclusion that your muscle contractions would then increase in frequency and in strength. But in actuality, when you have increased calcium in the blood and increased calcium in the extracellular fluid, one of the things that calcium is supposed to do normally is kind of clog up those sodium gated channels on the muscle cell. It doesn't block all of them, but it blocks some of them so that your muscle contractions aren't going to be too violent and too strong. So that is a normal occurrence. So the more calcium you have in the extracellular fluid, the more blocking you have of these gated channels. So if you're blocking more of those gated channels, do you think your muscles are going to be overactive or do you think they're gonna be underactive? Well, they're going to be underactive because 
even if acetyl acetylcholine binds to those um, acetylcholine receptors, calcium is already blocking those channels. And so sodium is not going to be able to go through those gated channels. So an increase in calcium in the extracellular fluid, which is hypercalcemia, that will actually cause your muscles to be weak because those um, ion channels are blocked. On the other hand, if we have low calcium levels, and so there's not as many, not as much calcium out here, so it's low calcium. Right, so we have less calcium, so they're not blocking these channels. Right? We don't have any blockage in there, and some of them should be blocked, but they're not being blocked. Right, So they're not being blocked, and acetylcholine then can bind to them and open them up. Now we're going to have increased sodium coming into the muscle cell, and then what do you think is going to happen with the muscle? Then the muscle is going to be overactive because there's a lot more stimulation, a lot more sodium coming in. So with hypocalcemia, we end up with, we'll see like twitches and spasms and things like that where the muscles are overactive. Whereas with hypercalcemia, we'll see muscle weakness. So I just want you guys to understand the difference between the calcium that's um, occurring inside the cell, inside that muscle cell, and then the calcium in the extracellular fluid, uh, and then to know the difference between hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia and how that affects the muscles. Okay, this ends day one of our um, chapter 10 lecture on muscle tissue.